Why do the British Royals wear poppies? Hello everyone, welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and today we're gonna to be talking about this poppy and why the British Royals throughout this season wear poppies on their shirts, on their coats, different areas to represent something very important, specifically World War one. So I'm going to share with you guys today a bit about the history of the poppy, why it's worn still by those who are remembering the fallen. And I'm going to share with you a bit as well about the tomb of the unknown soldier, because very much this is all wrapped up in World War One, which was hugely devastating on the British population, more so than in the United States. In the United States here, we don't we don't talk a lot about the First World War. It's not something it's basically like the opening opening act of World War Two is basically how it's seen. World War II was much more devastating for the United States as we didn't enter the war until about the last year. So if you have not been to the UK or you don't just know that much about why these poppies are so important, I'm going to share a little bit about that with you today. But if you guys haven't been here to Royal News Network before, like I said, my name is Brittany and I love talking about royals and I love analyzing and sharing about royals and their history. So if you love royals, this channel is definitely for you. So I'd love for you to subscribe. In addition, I also will be reviewing television shows and movies, including The Crown, and sharing history too. So if that's something you really enjoy, again, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to go on a trip to the UK with me, we'll be seeing some very historical and royalty-related sites. Feel free, I'll put a link in the description box and down below for that as well. Well, and in addition, I have a fashion page, so Royal Fashion News, so I will put a link in the description again for that channel. If you love royals, fashion, tiara, jewelry, that'll be all there. So, but like I said, the poppies. And you're probably wondering how I got a poppy. They are here in the United States, but you, you really don't see them at all. I'm sure you could get them somewhere. I actually got this in Guyana in South America and because I went there around Veterans Day and so they had these. So I asked her, I believe I asked one of the receptionists that they had another one and I believe she gave me hers if I remember correctly. I was at a hotel and I, I knew what they represented and I knew that royals wore them and I was just like, well, I want a poppy. Can I have a poppy? So that way I can feel like I was part of this really historic movement that's been around for a hundred years and remembering veterans and she was kind enough to just give me hers. <laughs> so I hope she had one at home. I'm sure they probably had a stack of them somewhere and she's like, oh, I'll just give this this weird American <laughs> mine and I'll just go find one somewhere, to, yeah, somewhere else. But this is something I kept it for that particular reason. It's funny because I spent some time in the UK around Veterans Day and I believe people wore them, but I just don't remember having one myself or wearing one, which is, I feel like kind of odd. But that was before I was very invested in royals and paying attention to them very closely. I was still interested, but it wasn't until Catherine and William got engaged. I was like, hardcore. I was like, oh my gosh, this is something I really want to know more about. But, but I know I did get a question from someone in the comments asking, why, why are they wearing the poppies? What's it about? So I thought I'd just do a whole video related to it because I think it is truly interesting and I really, really enjoy history and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, I don't know why, but for me, that's just, that just makes, it just makes my heart sing in a way in terms of what it represents and how it really is a great, and wonderful way to remember those who have been lost in battle and are unable to be identified for whatever reason. It's really, really beautiful to me, in my opinion. And it's something that we have it here in the United States. And I know there's some movements to identify the remains of a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And I, I understand the through DNA, they can actually figure out who this person is. But I think there's something beautiful to think about that the person in the tomb can be everyone and no one. And there, it is actually the only spot in Westminster Abbey where you cannot walk on the tomb of the unknown soldier if you if you did not know that you actually can't walk on it they always walk around it the royals do it's outlined in poppies and it's very very special and I gotta say though guys before we go on let's go ahead and watch Catherine explain the poppies to a little boy who asked her about it and she's like do you want my poppy and it's just so cute so go ahead and take a listen to this <laughs> My name is Catherine. Okay. Have you got a puppy? Yeah, very, very nice. Would you like mine? Yes. Yeah. Oh. You can have my puppy. There you go. See if I can get it out. Shall I see if I can get out? There we go. And do you know what this is for? It's remembering all the soldiers. Do you 
died in the war. There you go, that's for you. You look after it. <laughs> yeah? Maybe I'll give you, is your teacher here or your mummy here? Yes, mummy's here. Mm. Is your mummy here? <laughs> Shall I give her the pin in case she wants to put it on? <laughs> nice to meet you. What's your name? All right, guys, I just love that moment. It was so amazing for Catherine to do that. And it and it's a great way to start off this video, I feel like. So just to give you a brief history of the poppy, I, again, I'm not an expert in this area, so I'm just gonna show you a little, little bit of the research that I did. But these poppies are worn every November leading up to Remembrance Sunday. So that'll be this Sunday. And it's something the royals all do. And they have some that are just like this, which are just papery plastic that they can just pin on their outfits. And then they have some that are a lab, more elaborate and basically jewelry. And we've seen those on Catherine, the Princess of Wales before, and we, the Queen as well. And you repper, you can wear more to represent different members of your family. So if you have, a, for example, a couple members of your family, you can wear perhaps two, three, four, representing those different family members. There's also other colors. So white can represent those who, are against war and violence. And then you can also wear, and I'm really sad I don't have this one, a purple poppy, which represents animals that died in battle. Obviously that was huge for World War I. It was the last time horses were used really in combat in terms of moving things and being having act, an actual cavalry. This was the last time it was seen in a major conflict. I'm sure it's been seen in smaller skirmishes, but it was the last time it was used in major combat. And World War I is a really unique war and it's because it was the first time that the machine gun was extensively used and the first time mortars were used a lot. So the First World War started really with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was from Austria, Hungary, and he was killed by a Serbian nationalist terrorist group called the Black Hand. And it was an attempt to, they were in Sarajevo, Bosnia, which was controlled by Austria-Hungary at this point, and it was a protest against Austria-Hungary having control over the region. So this assassination basically launched the whole war. This was still at a time period when monarchies still had a significant level of power. Things were shifting, all jockeying for various alliances throughout this time. So this assassination really said, which was in many ways somewhat minor, set off this really huge conflict that really didn't need to. Because what it did is that Austria was aligned with Germany and then Serviejo, so Serbia was aligning with Russia. And so this brought about this huge conflict. Then you have France getting involved, Britain getting involved, and they rushed into this conflict. And because of the advances of technology, usually what they would do in terms of fighting is you would have two lines. They would walk up two lines, shoot at each other, and then go back and then re or reload. And they would get in close quarters combat, so that's why you had bayonets at the end of swords, so you could stab somebody. If you also have a cavalry coming in, the bayonets could be used against horses, against the riders, you could shoot them. So it was very much this lines, shoot, reassess, shoot again. <laughs> it was this very, in a way, archaic hearkening back to the beginning of time. So they also thought, they all thought that this would be the way how it goes. They would start off with horses and it would, it would all change. But once you introduce a machine gun and heavy artillery, things change drastically. So they started off this conflict and pretty soon you just got these, these trenches and these lines between these two sides because the, the heavy artillery meant that they couldn't move. They hadn't figured out how to be combative in this situation and how to, change how conflict is done in terms of modern warfare to actually make this all work. So basically they had one skirmish, everybody cut sides, and then they stayed there forever. <laughs> Not forever. So the alliances which have been discussed were between Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Canada, Japan, and eventually the United States. And again, this advance in military power really screwed both sides in many ways. So when it began, many people thought it would be over quickly. However, that's not what happened. And there was this aggressive military strategy from the Germans. Schleimflin plan? Germany began fighting this war on two fronts. So they invaded France through neutral Belgium and then to the, in the west and then to the Russia in the east. 
And eventually, as they were moving through Belgium, causing a lot of chaos and death, the Allied troops eventually met the German advance and checked it. So that basically means they were able to successfully mount a counterattack. And so the, the Germans held back a bit and they both ended up digging trenches. And those trenches did not move much throughout the next couple of years of the war. And then you basically have this massive no man's land, which we all are very aware of, I feel like. And this is really because the advance of heavy artillery meant you couldn't have a line of soldiers come out because they would get mowed down by the machine guns. And then you had artillery coming over too. So they, and they, you had mines in the ground and they really created this very caustic conflict that really had no end in sight because they didn't know how to fight this kind of war yet. So they didn't know what to do. So they were all just basically at this massive, massive stalemate for three years. And they've obviously the United States entering the war pretty much changed, changed the course of the conflict because the U.S. troops were fresh and the U.S. had a lot more troops than basically anybody else at this point. And they weren't bogged down in this conflict quite as much. So we entered the war late in the game. And part of it was that was the catalyst for it was the sinking of the Lusitania because you also had the advance too of submarines. Submarines were all of a sudden in play. You had the German U-boat. So the Lusitania was sunk and it was a considered a civilian liner, but there was a lot of concerns and a lot of talk that they had munitions on board for the British. It's actually kind of interesting. So I read the book on the Lusitania by Eric Lawson, I believe. And it was, it was kind of interesting because it, it, it it sank in an area that was very shallow. So the Titanic sank like two miles under the surface. I don't know what the kilometer says. Don't ask me. But it sank two miles under the surface. So the, the ship sank like this. But the Lusitania, because it was only under 300 feet or so of water, so it actually was because the, the engines kept going because it was hit by a torpedo. So the engines kept going. So it was driving itself into the water, but it hit the sediment down below. And so there was this time period where the caboose was up in the air and eventually it sunk, but it was just because, and part of it, it hit the bottom and the caboose was still up in the air because there was more, more space and it couldn't keep going because there was nowhere to go. It was a very tragic sinking. That's not what I'm saying, but as a historian, I get excited about these weird and interesting things. I find them fascinating. And I've been super interested in the Titanic before. There were actually three Titanic ships. Actually, one of them sank in World War I. So that was the Britannia, which was originally going to be called the Gigantic. And because they had the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic. So the Olympians, the Titans, the Giants from Greek mythology. Those were what the three ships were supposed to be named. The Olympic ended up being decommissioned totally. It was, did have an accident, almost sank and didn't. And it ended up being decommissioned and totally torn apart. It was smaller than the Titanic. Its parlor is still someplace in Britain. I can't quite remember. If I can find the name, I'll put it in there. If you're ever curious, you can go and see part of what was originally the Titanic. And like the dining room, this, I think it was one of the dining rooms. They basically got that and put that in there. The rest of it was scrapped. Then you had the Titanic, which sank. It sank in obviously, around Nova Scotia and Canada. So it sank in like two miles underneath the surface, it's slowly starting apart, falling apart too, which is kind of sad. At some point it will just collapse as the bacteria eats the steel. And then the third was the gigantic or what became known as the Britannic. And the Britannic was commissioned as a hospital ship. So it was, it actually hit a mine in the Mediterranean and sank. So it's under less water. So you can, I don't think you can, I'm not sure if you can snorkel or not snorkel. I don't know if you can scuba dive and visit. I don't know if it's under that much. And I don't think it's one of those ones that perhaps, I don't feel like you hear a lot of people who hang out and explore the Britannic. So I don't know if that's something that you can technically do or not. I don't know. I watched this show once that was really interesting about people who go around and find shipwrecks and, and take things from them and salvage them. It was, it was interesting. So that's, the segue neither here nor there, but that gives you an, a, an idea of how warfare was changing. You had mines in the ocean, you had U-boats, you had machine guns, you had mortar and artillery, and these were all new things. They had been used sporadically. One of the Gatling guns, I believe, was used in, in the Civil War. We had a, a very briefly utilized submarine, and I believe it was even a steel ship or something. I think they had rivets, I can't remember. 
quite how they do it. But they actually had some sort of U uh, a submarine thing that was sunk into the Civil War. So this, as the technology was growing and changing, they were they were developing these new things. But because of it, again, the, they had these stalemates where they couldn't figure out what to do, and people just got slaughtered. It was basically a slaughter and they would just shoot things between the two sides all the time they would advance and then retreat and these lines would move like a foot so it was basically nobody did anything <laughs> <laughs> anything. And by the time we got to World War II, they did figure out how to do this. And because the ground kept getting churned up by the mortar, by the machine guns, by the soldiers, eventually after the war ended, there were a lot of poppies that grew. And because of that, there was a poem that this gentleman wrote, which really resonated with a lot of people and has really become a symbol of why they use the poppies to this day. But it was written by John McCrae and it says, in Flanders Field, in Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the lark still bravely singing flies scarce heard amid the guns below we are the dead short days ago we lived felt dawn saw sunset glow loved and were loved and now we lie in flanders fields take up our quarrel with the foe to you from failing hands we throw the torch be yours to hold it high if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders field. And when it comes to combat deaths in the UK, they were very, very significant. This was the most brutal war in terms of actually having soldiers pass away. So about 6% of the British male population died in this conflict. And at some point there was 109 women to one man in the country. And in addition, about 12% of the soldiers died. And that's not just, that's just talking about the soldiers who died. That's not talking about those who were maimed, got sick because you had influenza, the Spanish influenza who that came right after the conflict ended. And you had a lot of people in closed and confined spaces. So this pandemic at the time grew rather quickly and killed a lot as well. So you had this very much this confluence of grief and death in the UK and these poppies came to remember it. And so these poppies now represent other wars and conflicts as well. It really harkens back to World War One. That is what truly led to the growth and use of the poppies. And World War One is also where we get the first real Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So this was a decision made because there were so many lives that were lost. So there were, wow, 880,000 British forces that died. So almost a million people died. And if Parliament had read every name of the men who had died. It would have taken them at least 11 hours to do so. And in comparison, in World War II, only 384,000 soldiers were killed in combat. The, there was a higher civilian death toll because as war has changed, the, the lines of conflict have gotten further into civilian territory. So whereas conflict used to be in a field out in nowhere and nobody was there and the, the soldiers would fight, they would, they would raid villages and those sorts of things. But the actual combat was generally held outside of civilian territories. As the weapons of war have grown and have gotten longer, ranges that means civilians more and more are becoming targets and are more being dragged into the conflicts themselves which is something i feel like is rather sad reflection on our team period and we've seen this for example in ukraine as well we've seen civilians who are just walking around and all of a sudden there's a shell that comes in near a mall and people are out walking in a park and all of a sudden a shell hits and the impact of that so this really started in world war one and then grew massively in world war ii especially with the advances of airplanes and bo carpet bombing that they did a lot not only the germans but the british and the americans as well we all were engaged in the carpet bombing and there's also a important little note to make as well. This is also when the change happened and the Russia became the Soviet Union. The Tsar Nicholas II and his wife were taken hostage with their children and they were eventually killed by Soviet soldiers. So this is a time of great upheaval and change. So, But the poppies really started to be used in being sold in 1921 and it was a fun for soldiers as well. So they would manufacture these flowers and sell them to raise monies. Selling the poppies proved so popular that in 1922 the British Legion founded a factory staffed by a disabled ex-servicemen to produce its own and continues to do so today. If you go around the UK, you do have the opportunity to purchase a poppy if you want to. And I would like to have like a really nice one at some point. I think that would be 
that would be really cool. So the reason poppies are used, according to the BBC, is to remember those who have given their lives in battle. We've seen Catherine wear them. I believe she has a couple of members of her extended family who passed away in World War One, and we had that impact in the Queen's family as well. So moving on to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So this is a tomb in Westminster Abbey. You will see it as a, it's at the front doors. So when they walk into the Abbey, you see it on the ground. It's usually surrounded by poppies, this frame of poppies. And it's the only place, so you can walk, stand, tap, dance, on basically graves of incredibly famous and influential people. However, you cannot step on the grave of the tomb of the unknown soldier. So I started reading about it and I thought it was something that would be great to share. Four bodies were dug up and covered in Union Jack flags and were brought back to a chapel from different areas. So the Asin, the Psalm, the Eras, and the Ypres, the commander of the British troops in France and Flanders, Brigadier General L. Wyatt, chose the warrior and the remaining three were buried in St. Paul. The unknown warrior then made its way to London, where crowds lined the streets in silence as a coffin was pulled by horse and carriage. It was decided the unveiling of the cenotaph would be part of the funeral of the uh, of the unknown warrior. When the funeral procession reached Whitehall, King George V laid a wreath atop the uh, unknown warrior's coffin before proceeding to unveil the cenotaph. I, with the three boys, received the body at the cenotaph, which had been brought from France yesterday. The funeral procession came from Victoria Station. At 11 Oh, I unveiled the cenotaph, and then two minutes silence throughout the whole empire. The whole ceremony was impressive, most moving, was most moving and impressive. I then followed the gun carriage on foot to Westminster Abbey, where the burial took place. The grave was filled in with soil brought from France. The service was beautiful and conducted by the dean. So this is from King George V's own recollections of the event. And so in a private ceremony every year, the queen honors the unknown soldier and the royal family's associate with the First World War and the grave. So one of her brothers, a British officer named Fergus Bowles Leon, died in World War One. He served with the 8th Battalion of the Black Watch. And so when the Queen goes to honor, so she's remembering him, and as part of the ceremony, she places a bouquet of flowers featuring orchids and myrtle based on Her Majesty's own wedding bouquet in 1947, which and it's placed on the tomb of the unknown warrior in an act of remembrance. And this actually tradition starts with the Queen Mother herself because of her brother. When she was leaving Westminster Abbey after marrying her husband, she placed her wedding bouquet on the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, remembering not only her brother, but all of those who died. And it's a tradition that has stuck and every royal bride, her bouquet, if she is married at St. George's or if she's married at Westminster Abbey, like Kate, is eventually taken back and placed on the tomb in remembrance of those who had died. And because the Queen Mother left her her bouquet on the tomb of the unknown soldier she became the only royal bride to ever walk out of the church without her flower bouquet and again i feel like that's so deeply deeply moving and it's just one of those things where you see something like that and it just evokes the sense of imagery and why royals can be such a great influence on the the country and the culture and so i just Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, it just, I just absolutely love it. I came to first be aware of this, this phenomenon where they weren't able to identify soldiers. Now today, they could probably uncover the remains of a lot of these men and identify them for their families, which some have been asked to do. They've had this asked of them at, for example, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in the United States. They've been asked, and sometimes they have uncovered the remains, done DNA testing, and identified who the soldier is. But what I love about this idea of the unknown is that this soldier can be everyone and no one. So if you've lost your brother, your husband, your uncle, your father in World War I, you can come to the tune of the unknown soldier and you can mourn them because it could be them or it could not. Be. And again, I feel like that's something that deeply, deeply resonates. We also see this with tombs if you've ever been to Normandy. They have something similar, because again, so if, if you see one of the tombs and they don't know who the soldier is, they say, here rests 
in honored glory, a comrade in arms known but to God. And I love that. That's always the sentiment. And I feel like most of the tomb of the unknown soldiers that you see is the sentiment where we don't know who this person is, but God knows who this person is. And I love that they, the Royals have this tradition and something that they've continued. The queen was very, very passionate about it. And I really see the Royal, rest of the Royals really bringing this in continuing to bring this into the 21st century. A hundred years after the Battle of World War I, they have been able to really keep up this tradition. I feel like it's something where you see the poppies and you're just like, oh yeah, let's just, let's take a moment and remember our veterans. So guys, happy Veterans Day. I hope you found this video enjoyable and helpful. I realize I probably rambled a bit on it, but I do love history and I was trying to remember all the things. I've actually been to the World War I Museum here in the United States. I was there not too long ago. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.